All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, I've been asked today to talk about uh, mTOR inhibitors for this geroscience task force. And, and what I hope to do is uh, tell you a little bit about why I think that rapamycin and maybe other mTOR inhibitors you know, really are our best shot on goal right now for geroscience interventions that could have a, a pretty significant clinical impact, uh, some of the data in support of that, and then also, you know, some of the indications that I think are potential uh, good targets for moving forward uh, in clinical trials and, and where I hope to see uh, the field go. Um, so I, I think probably everybody uh, on this task force understands why mTOR is an interesting target in the context of geroscience. So um, both genetic inhibition of mTOR or pharmacological inhibition of mTOR with rapamycin um, is known to increase lifespan uh, and delay age-related functional declines in all of the major model organisms that are studied in the field. Uh, if you look at the hallmarks of aging, you can find evidence, uh, often um, very clear mechanistic evidence, that inhibition of rapamycin can have an impact directly on those hallmarks of aging. And I think, you know, really importantly in a mammal, in, in mice and rats, where we can actually look at functional declines that go along with aging or pathology, there's evidence that rapamycin can either delay those functional declines or in, in several cases now actually reverse those functional declines in old animals. Um, it's the most robust and reproducible way to extend lifespan in mice other than caloric restriction. Not a lot of data yet, but perhaps even more consistent than caloric restriction across different genetic backgrounds. Uh, rapamycin, of course, has been used safely in people for more than 20 years, so we know a lot about uh, uh, clinical evidence, uh, including side effects uh, to be paying attention to with rapamycin. And from my perspective, I think the thing that makes it most convincing is it works, and it works every time in every organism. And I think if we're being honest, uh, we'll recognize that in this field, that's actually pretty rare. There are no controversies around rapamycin. Everyone agrees it works and it works well. Um, so rapamycin uh, is the most widely studied mTOR inhibitor uh, uh, in general and in the geroscience uh, aging field as well. There are, of course, uh, derivatives of rapamycin that they sort of are, go under the name rapalogs. So they all function biochemically um, identically to rapamycin. Uh, this includes uh, everolimus or RAD001 and, and several others, um, uh, at least three or four of which uh, are FDA approved. Um, and I think the thing that's important to appreciate is rapalogs are extremely clean drugs. As far as I know, there are no significant off-target effects. They all work through the same allosteric mechanism and specifically inhibit mTOR complex one. Um, there are other types of mTOR inhibitors that are primarily ATP competitive active site inhibitors. Um, and they fall into a couple of classes. These are not specific for mTOR complex one. So these will also hit mTOR complex two. Um, and sometimes they hit other kinases with, with uh, different relative affinity. So there are these dual PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitors. This includes BEZ235 or RTB101. Um, again, not specific for mTOR. Uh, and then there are more mTOR specific ATP competitive inhibitors like TORIN1, TORIN2. Um, again, important to appreciate those are hitting both mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two. And I think a big gap in the literature right now is really um, none of these, as far as I know, have been tested in any significant way for effects on lifespan or health span metrics um, uh, in any organism, but, but particularly in mice. And so, you know, I think this is a question that, that really should have been addressed already and still needs to be addressed. Do any of these molecules work with similar, maybe even better efficacy than, than rapamycin in the context of aging? Um, but for now, we do have quite a bit of data on rapamycin. Um, <clears throat> Probably everyone knows that rapamycin was discovered on Easter Island or, or Rapa Nui. That's where the drug gets its name from. Um, and as I've already mentioned, it's been FDA approved for use in organ transplant patients for more than 20 years. Um, in the context of aging, it is the most effective longevity drug identified to date, increases lifespan in mice up to about 25 to 30 percent. And from a translational perspective, it's really important to appreciate that you get pretty much the full benefits of rapamycin, it looks like, from treatments started in middle age and even relatively short-term treatments during middle age. So eight to 12 weeks in mice is enough to give most, if not all of the benefits of, of rapamycin treatment. And again, as I've already alluded to, 
um, it seems to broadly delay or even reverse molecular and functional phenotypes of aging across many, maybe all tissues and organs in mice, um, a subset of which are shown here uh, at the right. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that's been, you know, particularly um, interesting and exciting is that that we now know that you can actually reverse functional declines that go along with aging in several tissues. Three of those that have been studied most extensively are the heart, the immune system, and the oral cavity in mice. And I think these are particularly good areas to be thinking about in terms of indications to, to look at for a, a clinical trial. Again, in many ways, you know, it's easier to hit an endpoint if you're looking at improving uh, function as opposed to just delaying the declines in function when you're, when you're thinking about a clinical trial. And then, of course, this is data from my lab where we showed that just a 12-week treatment uh, starting at 20 months of age in mice is enough to robustly increase lifespan in this particular cohort is about a 60% increase in remaining life expectancy, which, again, we have no way to know whether this will translate through to people in, in any sort of relative sense. If it did, that would be about two decades for a typical 50-year-old woman, so potentially pretty significant um, uh, impact on, on lifespan and, and health span metrics. Um, and again, I think, you know, it's worth looking at rapamycin in the context of many of the other interventions that people think about. And, and I've been trying to, to figure out how to really do a, an apples to apples comparison, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, that's quite hard to do in this field because people use different strains of mice and, and different ways of, of doing their, their treatments. This is a, a graphic where I have tried to extract the data for C57 black six males uh, from several different studies, which are shown at right. And it was using this, this automated um, digitizer here, if, if anybody's interested in, in, in reproducing this. The way that this graphic is represented is the, the, the left-hand side of the arrow are, is the median control lifespan in that study. The right-hand side of the arrow is the uh, median treatment lifespan. And so all of these were reported to increase lifespan. The arrows are all going to the right. But I think one thing you'll notice immediately is the relative length of the arrows or the magnitude of the effect is different. And importantly, many of these studies suffer from particularly short-lived controls. Um, and in several cases, metformin, nicotinamide riboside, intermittent fasting, the long-lived treatment group is actually shorter lived than the controls for some of these other studies. And, and to my mind, that's a real weakness in understanding whether these interventions are actually working when the controls are short-lived. Now, it's also, I, I think, a fair uh, statement that some of these studies are, are starting treatments during middle age. And so one way to try to control for these, uh, control for the short-lived controls is to exclude animals that died before about 800 days of age when, um, when, when some of these studies were finishing their, their treatments. And so I've done that. Uh, and, and what you can see here is if we, if we exclude the animals that died early, um, of course, everything shifts to the right, but still the short, shorter lived uh, controls tend to come out short lived and, and shorter lived. And again, you can see the effects of nicotine riboside, metformin, intermittent fasting, in my view, are not particularly convincing when the long lived groups are actually shorter lived than the controls in the rapamycin or the senolytics um, experiment. So to my eye here, the things that really look pretty robust, senolytics, small effect, but it looks real, alpha ketoglutarate, maybe. Um, rapamycin and caloric restriction really look like the, the, the obvious winners to me here. And so that, you know, again, solidifies in my mind that, you know, we don't get a lot of shots on goals. And uh, to my view, we should be taking those shots with, with the interventions that are, that are likely to give us the, the biggest chance of success. And I really believe that um, rapamycin falls into that category. Um, and we know we've got some data in people that I think actually support that as well. You know, it's not rock solid, nothing is at this point in this field, but there have been two phase two clinical trials in healthy older people treated with the rapamycin derivative, Everolimus. Um, in both of those studies, uh, there was evidence for improved uh, influenza vaccine response. Um, and the people who got the rapamycin derivative appeared to be protected against upper respiratory tract infections in the, the following season. So suggestive, certainly, that uh, what's been seen in mice in terms of restoration of, 
of uh, immune function may also happen in people. Um, probably as all of you are aware, Restore Bio, the company that was doing these studies, took the rapamycin derivative out of their pivotal phase three trial, went forward with RTB101, one of the ATP competitive inhibitors, um, failed to hit their endpoint halfway through. The endpoint in this particular case was patient reported infections. And so they shut the study down in November, 2019. And, and if you're interested in reading about this, um, Joan Manick has published uh, the results of that study in, in Lancet Healthy Longevity here. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, ironic. You can't help but wonder if they knew where the world was going three or four months later, if they would have shut that study down. And indeed, looking back at the data from that study, there's some suggestive evidence that, that the people who got the mTOR inhibitor um, may have had a, an improved antiviral response, particularly to influenza and coronavirus. So, you know, one of those accidents of history will never, we may never actually know the answer. But I think the key point here is there's suggestive data actually that a rapamycin or a rapamycin derivative can boost immune function in the elderly. And importantly, at the doses that, that people are thinking about now, little if any in the way of side effects. And so, you know, I think this leads into the question of why haven't people paid more attention clinically to testing rapamycin in the context of geroscience? I think, you know, the reputation problems are real. Um, and this largely stems from the way that the drug has been used uh, historically, the way it was developed, which is a little unfortunate in organ transplant patients. There, there are some side effects of rapamycin in that context. Of course, those are sick people taking uh, immunosuppressants in addition to rapamycin. Um, I think we've learned and, and will continue to learn, in my view, that, that at the lower doses that people are talking about, the once weekly dosing, um, little, if any, in the way of significant side effects from, from rapamycin monotherapy, um, but, but time will tell. It certainly has been a challenge, though, with moving forward with clinical trials. I also think, you know, it's unfortunate, but a lot of scientists do what's easy. Um, and, you know, because of the reputation problems, um, there, there is a little more work involved in getting a clinical trial going with rap rapamycin and getting it through the IRB. There's also a little bit of shiny new object syndrome in this field. And I think people, you know, have known rapamycin works really well uh, in preclinical studies and, 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 and haven't paid as much attention as they probably should have. Then, of course, rapamycin is off patent and it's been off patent for many years. And so there hasn't been a lot of incentive for companies to move forward with clinical trials um, for rapamycin for other indications. That, I think, is being helped by newer versions of rapamycin. So there's a company called Trivium Vet that has a version of rapamycin that's enteric coded for better release in the intestine. There are some other uh, potentially more mTORC1 specific inhibitors that are rap rapalogs that are being developed. And then, of course, the catalytic inhibitors that I talked about. Um, so what's happening right now? So, so we are carrying out a clinical trial of rapamycin in companion dogs. This is a study of uh, 580 uh, large middle-aged dogs. The endpoint for this study is lifespan. Um, it's a one-year treatment with two years of follow-up, uh, and we are statistically powered to detect a 9% change in lifespan, which is towards the lower end of the um, of what's been seen in mice. This is a real clinical trial in veterinary clinics in companion dogs living with their owners. Um, and then in addition to lifespan, we are trying to look as broadly as we can at health span metrics, um, including heart function, cognitive function, disease incidence, activity, things like that. And we have some, I think, intriguing preliminary data from, from uh, two smaller safety trials, but this will really be the trial that answers the question, does rapamycin slow aging in companion dogs? There are some um, other studies that are happening now in people, and, and several of these are funded by this new Impetus Grants program. I really want to give a shout out to the Impetus Grants folks, um, and I think they are really uh, accelerating progress in, in the field. So we are doing a study of people who have been taking rapamycin off-label, collecting survey, medical and dental record data from those people to try to understand particularly side effects, but also, you know, get some hints for efficacy, maybe identify some interesting case reports. Um, there's a clinical trial funded by the Impetus Program, and Jonathan Ahn is running this out of the University of Washington to look at whether rapamycin can improve periodontal disease in people. Another clinical trial from Zev Williams and Yushin Su, also funded by the Impetus Program out of Columbia to look at whether rapamycin can have an impact on ovarian failure um, in women. And then a clinical trial that's that's being uh, set up by Brad Stanfield out of New Zealand to look at the effect of rapamycin on muscle function in older people. And I think we'll get some, you know, in the next couple of years, we may have a much better feel for what 
sorts of effects rapamycin could be having in, in older, relatively healthy people. So that um, leads me to the last, the last uh, point I want to make here is what are some of the indications we might want to be thinking about uh, from a geroscience perspective? Really, I think, you know, it's a bevy of riches in a lot of ways. You could certainly um, pretty much pick your favorite age-related endpoint and, and find a reason to believe that rapamycin could have an effect there. I'm particularly intrigued by conditions that are associated with age-related inflammation. There's existing data, case reports uh, for inflammatory bowel disease, joint capsule disorders, autoimmune disease. Um, I personally know several people who have benefited um, from rapamycin for these specific indications, so I'm a pretty big believer. Uh, mitochondrial disorders are another area of interest. There's existing case reports for both childhood and adult onset mitochondrial disorders. Cognitive decline, dementia, particularly, I think, APOE4 homozygotes, skin aging, work from Chris Sell's lab, um, suggestive that rapamycin can attenuate senescence in skin in the context of aging. Existing data, both in companion animals and in people for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy. I've already mentioned oral health and periodontal disease. I haven't mentioned salivary dysfunction. I also think this is a pretty interesting endpoint to think about, something that's a challenge for many older people. And then I also mentioned ovarian senescence and menopause. So lots of different um, endpoints uh, just on this slide. And again, I think this is a fairly short list. Um, you could certainly identify others, but I, I'm pretty excited to see you know, where we go with rapamycin and other mTOR inhibitors clinically in the next few years in the context of geroscience. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a really a real chance that uh, that we could we could actually have a pretty good feel for efficacy, like I said, in the next few years. So I'm excited to see where where the field goes. Um, so with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention.